So welcome to another edition of the Influence Global podcast. And I'm super excited to have a wonderful guest with me today. Uh, no other than Martine Croxall, who we met um, what seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it, Martine? Um, when was it in? March 2018, I yes. think. My God, what a memory. That yeah, was... I was hosting a conference and you, and you were one of the delegates. So we met then. Yeah. Well, and then you, that's right. And then you came to a BPMA uh, patrons dinner. Um, yeah, you very kindly I, invited me. It was nice I, little I snosh that night. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, I've had a lovely look around the BBC as well, which was a great experience. So I thought um, today we talk very much about your role as a news anchor, but also about what you do outside of the news. And I know you're a very successful conference host and it'd be really interesting to see how somebody in your position really does uh, promote their influence. Um, I want to touch on trust as well, why people trust uh, news presenters or not, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and what that really entails. Um, so to start with, uh, remind ourselves, how long have you been at the BBC? Oh dear, there's a leading question. Um, I have been at the BBC my entire career, which will be 32 years this October. Oh my goodness. And what did you do? What was your first job? I started doing work experience and I literally answering the phone, emptying the bin, making cups of tea. Really? And that's what led to uh, some paid work, clerical work. And then I've been there about six weeks and they asked me to go and do a, a little outside broadcast in the centre of Leicester uh, for the launch of a charity that was raising money to plant a forest, national forest. And I said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to see myself on camera or hear myself on air. I've come here to be a producer very much behind the scenes. And they said, uh, there's nobody else to go, so you're going. And they were a bit kinder than that, but I was really frightened, really terrified, because it's not what I intended to be doing with my time at all. Mm. And I did it, and I actually enjoyed it, and I was more than competent at it. And so from that little moment where I interviewed a man dressed as a character called Woody Tree, Right. who was in this sort of uh, rubber tree costume of which there is photographic evidence and um, I then learned to operate the radio car so the next six months I was pretty much going out around Leicestershire and Rutland reporting live so I sort of did my broadcasting a bit back to front most people normally start with recorded work and then move on to live work but I did it the other way around and then I trained as a journalist through the BBC's various training schemes and courses and I did every job on the station, moved into regional television to do a training attachment, got a job at what was um, Newsroom South East, now BBC London. And then in 2000, I moved to Television Centre and started working in on network programmes. So it was not the career I expected, but it's been uh, quite a lot of fun. Yeah, it looks like it is. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of seeing the studio, which is um, really amazing to be uh, so close to seeing you broadcast, you know, live to the nation or, of course, BBC 24 as well. Um, that's quite an experience just to see what goes on behind the, the proximity. And, uh, and of course, now some of the studios are all very modern with modern technology, aren't they? So you've got to you've got to have everything. What's it like to have, have um people in your ear all the time it always fascinates me with how you concentrate on the subject and you've got somebody babbling away in your ear <laughs> yeah it's it's one of those things that you just get used to doing you know it's like anything it's practice mm. I think the fact that I'd done six about six years in radio before I moved into television helped I was used to wearing headphones and used to hearing people in my ear um, and then the natural sort of next step was to be in vision while you're doing that um I mean not everybody can do it it would appear you know it's one of those things isn't it where I always think well anybody can do that can't they because yeah. you can do it and you think well, if I can do it anyone can and then when you see somebody doing it who perhaps struggles with it a bit or doesn't necessarily have that aptitude that you might have you realize that there is some skill involved and I teach other people like sort of fledgling presenters the tricks of the trade so in a few hours I can hopefully impart some quite useful things that I've learned over the last 30 years mm. in a few hours so that they they can sort of not get into bad habits and, and create good habits from, from the start so that's quite a nice thing to do I mean the tour that you got money can't buy Gordon 
um you, you know we don't <laughs> do tours of the bbc buildings anymore partly for security reasons yeah um, but yeah it's fascinating because it's our office you know it's our where we go to work and when you do have visitors in and we haven't really had people back in because since covid Ooh. um you do sort of see it afresh through your visitors eyes and realize that it is an impressive operation and when it's really driving a breaking news story that's when it comes into its own and again that kind of work environment isn't for everybody it can be a bit crash band wallop and sort of blows your hair back but um if you like that sort of broadcasting and i do um there's nothing better nothing beats it as far as i'm i'm, I'm concerned so on that note uh obviously one of the biggest news stories of late would have been the uh uh, the announcement of the Queen uh, dying mm -hmm. um, was that was that who is that that broke that? Did you do that as well, or I can't remember? No, that was that was Hugh Edwards who was on air, and he was on air for quite a few hours before um, the Queen's death was confirmed. So I was on air in April 2021 when the Duke of Edinburgh died, and that came out as a piece of breaking news. There was no real preamble to it. I think we got the um, the news just before midday and by nine minutes past 12, having broken the news and sustained for about four or five minutes, six minutes maybe, we then went, we joined all five English speaking TV networks together and I was on a, on all of them for the official announcement where the screen goes to black this slate this sort of graphic announcement um comes up and then you sort of start the program all over again effectively with that formal announcement and i it, i have spoken about this in the past it was a really scary moment where i just had this almost sort of out of body experience where i thought i don't want to be here for this I, I, this is huge mm. and it's so important that we get it right as the nation's broadcaster as something that is going to be part of the archive it's a piece of history of course it will get played again and again and you know you've got to get it right mm. and eventually it, it, in the end my this other voice in my head said don't be ridiculous you know what you're doing and because you're surrounded by people who are really skilled the people behind the scenes who you don't see or hear about they all know what they're doing. They're all immensely talented and professional. So you're in extremely safe hands. So in the end, it's a privilege to do this sort of work. And you you are just the front person. You know, you are acutely aware that there are lots and lots of other people behind you making sure that it, that it happens and, and happens in a polished, professional way. Yeah, indeed. Um, and that's how it always comes over to me um, when I watch the BBC. It's very professional, you know, seasoned veterans that know what they're doing. Thank goodness but, for that. <laughs> uh, I just wondered if there is uh, a moment of emotion, bearing in mind you're often talking about some very, very tragic stories. I remember I remember the Ukrainian documentary train that Fergal um, Keane did that really moved me to, 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 to tears. It was so graphic you know it reminded me almost of the second world war and and i was and that's because of the way it was presented on on air as a documentary but you must have seen some horrific stories that you have to do you get like seasoned to it and you think i've just got to do my job or does do, do things really get to you so yes they get to you but it's about to the, the extent to which you show that uh I did a talk at a school a few years back and a teenager asked me the question, what's the most important thing to get right? And, well, obviously don't libel anybody because that's very expensive and you don't want to defame someone. But it's it's all about tone. What's the appropriate tone for the story? Am I supposed to be serious? Can I afford to be lighthearted? And if you get it wrong, it really jars and everybody notices it. When you get it right, nobody notices it. Hmm. There are stories sometimes that, particularly if they're breaking uh, news stories and they literally come up in front of you and you are breaking that news, you haven't had a chance to read it in advance and you're picking your way through the words that are in front of you on a press release or a you know wire news snap. And sometimes it gets under your 
skin you know it just catches you for a moment and then you have to deal with that because I'm not there to tell you how to feel mm, I'm there to tell you the facts as far as we know them and I'm there to try and challenge your th- people in public office and hold people to account but how you feel is up to you mm. so if mm. I don't look outraged and you think I should then that's I'm doing my job because I I'm not meant to tell you how I feel or how I think it's like the I'm queen saying. it's like the queen always used to have no expression and in a way um everybody always referred to her as stoic almost as somebody that would yeah. that never you know never dropped her guard uh, I think the, the the thing is though it's okay to have compassion mm. it's okay to be human and humane and we say you know we must be impartial and yes but there are some things that are just morally right and morally wrong mm. and you know if somebody has died it's okay to sound solemn about it you don't have to be robotic about it. No, of course not. The stories that I think really got under my skin are the one, the, the terror attacks. Mm. So there were there was ISIS as well, the beheadings that happened that we used to get reported on a Friday night. And I would report those and you'd be talking about horrific, horrific brutality mm. for hours on end. And then the terror attacks happened in Paris. The terror attacks happened in London, London Bridge. And I was on air for all of those. And you do go home. And I think the older I get, the worse I am, really, I suppose, because, you know, how many more years have I got on <laughs> this uh, on this earth? Um, and life's so precious and increasingly so, you know, your own humanity hits you in the face, doesn't it, when you get to a certain age, I suppose. And I do get home sometimes and I do, I do feel very upset. Mm, I can imagine. but you deal with that away from you deal with that away from yeah from work. yeah no I can understand that it's it's so important and you know just moving on to that trust is a major part of what influence is all about mm. and you know when you consider um the BBC is an organization that is trusted the world over um for its impartiality although some would disagree but you know it doesn't matter who who says that or what says that largely you have a place in most people's hearts as as trust how does that convey itself down to the to people like yourself to the presenters because you know we you're you're you know you're in people's living rooms in a big big way and you're telling some very important stories um and you know, trusting what comes out of your mouth is super important, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you, you're drawn to the BBC in the first place because of what it stands for, because of those values of impartiality, accuracy, truth, trust, um, transparency, uh, fairness. We're drawn to that. Um, there's one of my favourite TED Talks was by Simon Sinek. You've probably... Of course I know him very well, yes. The Why... Like the most successful organizations he reckons are those that know why they do something. Of course. And I think the the kind of the strength of the BBC is that the people within it know why they turn up for work every day. Mm. And it is to be the most trusted and creative news and media organization, broadcast organization in the world. Now, we don't always get it right. We know we don't. We know that trust is on the decrease in news organizations but the bbc is still doing well we're not complacent about that which is why the drive to transparency is very important the idea being if we show you how it's made you'll be able to trust it Mm, yeah i also think that that tone thing um be yourself i mean i don't like the word authentic it almost sounds inauthentic to say be authentic but you you know me Mm, I do. and I'm pretty similar not exactly the same of course but I'm pretty similar off air as I am on air you are yeah it's very different there aren't many differences it's mostly to do with um the grammar of television you know you are on tv it is all a bit artificial but um I'm very much me 
on mm. television. And the first thing that I was really taught when I worked in local radio was you're only talking to one person at a time. Mm. And I've never forgotten that. Yeah. So I would rarely say, um, good evening, everyone, because I'm only talking to you. Mm. Yeah. You're listening and watching as an individual. Yeah. And I think if you can build that rapport with people, that holds on to that trust. You build trust. And I hope that, you know, with the 32 years experience I've got, people know they can trust what I'm saying and I won't say something unless I'm pretty sure <laughs> that I'm on safe ground you know because mm. um, you lose trust very quickly and it takes a long time to rebuild it if you ever get it back so it is an extraordinarily precious commodity it, well it is and also offline so you know um where Twitter for example is is a common um news medium a social media medium for journalists um mm. I, I, i'm not always a fan i must admit um but that's also because there are people that jump on the bandwagon of that with some unpleasant commentary um, mm. and that can be quite damaging so how important is it for you as uh, an individual to express your thoughts and views about certain things and yet you're also a news broadcaster that is this beacon of trust you well, like you don't is the answer. you you will agree or disagree with some comments that are out there won't you and and i guess that's freedom of speech but how do you balance those two well i make a point of following as many different uh, people with many different views as possible because i need to be aware of what the sort of range of views are because i'm going to be interviewing on subjects where there are a range of there is a range of views mm. so i do follow people and organizations um that i don't agree with but i follow the bbc's guidelines on social media and to a great extent in my private life mm. there are certain things that i will never divulge even privately and so even with my own children, I'm very cautious about what I say about politics because they know that my views can't be disseminated. Yeah, I don't want I don't want them to be. Yeah, you know, I don't have this need to sort of take my authentic self into the into the newsroom. No, um, I'm very happy on social media to explain why we do what we do. Sometimes people have questions and they might start off being a bit miffed about what we've done but if you can explain our thinking what we do how we set things up how we execute things often people are glad of the interaction yeah you and, can try and explain a bit to, to them and of course you've got your own vetting system broadcasting with Shamir Amira haven't you what's the name I've forgotten the name now um the BBC um service that that comes up at the weekend where you they check what's been used oh just, samira ahmed uh, presents news watch right. yes so she yes and that's then right. there's points of view and then there's the media show that's it and um feedback on radio four so yeah we try to give people um a right of reply well audiences the opportunity to raise issues make complaints and try to answer them again some people will think that we don't answer them well enough yeah yeah but, there are there's an opportunity for people to to express their you know, dissatisfaction with what we do yeah yeah no no i understand that so let's talk about outside of uh bbc because you have got a uh a great career as um uh, as a conference host and mc and of course i've seen you in action as well um tell us a little bit about how that came about and how long have you been doing that I it, well the, first of all the BBC is very clear that we can't just do any old work outside the BBC we have an approval system so if you want to do some work outside whether it's writing an article or um, a, hosting a conference or a panel discussion you have to get approval in advance oh really um, oh, okay. yeah and you declare whether you're being paid who the organizer is how the invitation came along and what the um, fee is if you're being paid a fee uh, because there have been times where when those rules weren't clear or those rules weren't enforced that invitations were accepted to events that in a, ideally a BBC person wouldn't wouldn't be associated with so if it's something that's overtly commercial or political the, the answer will probably be no 
But if you're working for an umbrella organization of a, for a trade sector, an industry sector, it's probably going to be yes, as long as you can show that you are not going to be required to promote any one in particular mm. or express opinions on things. And I also try to make sure that if I'm hosting a panel discussion, that there is balance within that panel. Yeah. So you've got people from different sides of a political divide for example just makes it easier to justify doing it but you still have to be you know robust and balanced and impartial as the moderator of that discussion so it came about i think the first conference i did oh, was probably about 10 years ago mm -hmm. um and I've what session was that in that was in to do with um employee ownership so uh companies that are owned by their own staff so it's a sort of small but growing sector of, of, of businesses. And I've been and they wanted to build a relationship with someone who would come back time and time again to host their events. And I've now got to know quite a lot of companies in that sector. I'm hosting it, their conference again for them in Liverpool in November. They're called the Employee Ownership Association. So they're an umbrella organization for companies that are owned by their own staff. Some of some, some of the big names that you would have heard of. Uh, John Lewis and uh, co-op and companies like that, Arup, the engineers, um, but also um, companies that you would never have heard of. So it's a, a really nice sector with a group of people I'm getting to know better and better. So that was the first one. Um, I had an agent who was approached by the association. They, they'd seen me posting the papers in particular and thought they that my style, my, I'm quite informal in my mm. style, and they thought that that would suit the way they do business. So, oh, great! And um, and you've obviously done lots of others since. I mean, we we met at or saw you at the FedEx conference, wasn't it? Yes, um, with the supplier and ethical data exchange, um, and that was a very uh, very interesting one. But uh, this is the benefit with being a journalist is that you can you can cross all sorts of sectors. You haven't got one niche. Uh, in play you've just got this independent um, non-biased approach um, but that's not the case of course with all journalists I mean there are there are journalists that are you know heavily entrenched in one view viewpoint and are quite vocal about it that aren't yeah. necessarily working at the BBC of course no, no you'd you'd probably find um, working at the BBC a frustrating experience if you felt the need to express your opinion and that's perfectly permissible it's just that we're not and I'm I'm totally okay with that of course um I like the academic exercise of it in fact that you need to be able to see all sides of an argument and I think some of the skills being a live um tv broadcaster are really useful when it comes to hosting events mm. be it a panel discussion or a, or a conference because things change things go wrong the organizers want to alter the the order of things add stuff in take stuff out and i'm very happy going on stage thinking i know where we're going and then having to change things and you know do handbrake turns and add stuff take stuff away and sort of edit on the hoof really yeah and just to respond to things going wrong either with a bit of humor or being fleet of foot enough to sort of cover it up without anybody noticing. So talking about going wrong, what has gone wrong? <laughs> oh gosh, so many things. I feel like I'm, um, my Twitter biography says star of um, rogue camera video clips. Um, oh really, go on. Yeah, well viral, some, some of the stuff has gone viral that I've done because it's been funny. Go so um, because our cameras are automated, which means that they, rely upon a, a code in a computer file to make them do what we want them to do. If the wrong code has been left in that file or the you know, codes haven't been taken out, the camera will do exactly as the code tells it. It's just if the code's wrong, and that's probably down to human error, mm. um, but we always blame the tech, don't we? Um, <laughs> it means the camera will be in the wrong place. So sometimes you've, you know, you're, you're caught empty chaired. So you're standing at what we call the catwalk, which is by the big screens in the side of the studio. Yes. And the camera has stayed put or so moved back to the desk. And it's how you cope with that. And I've, it's happened to me so many times. Oh, so, really? many, so many funny things have happened to me on air. I think because I've been doing it such a long time and my style is quite informal and hopefully warm and engaging and approachable. And 
people like it mm. when you're when you're honest uh, and they love it when stuff goes wrong yeah. I mean, it, it literally well it makes it more relatable now because yeah. you are the bastion of professionalism and um i even remember once the queen said at one event when the lights didn't go on she said we love it when something goes wrong you know she she almost reveled in it really yeah. well, it, makes it, it makes it more memorable doesn't it, it does. and, you know, i used to host the papers review um for many many years i i did that late in the evening and that got quite a sort of a following because it was a different style of doing things it was very informal it was a chat it was like eavesdropping on conversations with journalists who were very well informed who were very articulate sometimes quite opinionated but um they they appeared over and over again and so they the viewers got to know certain pairings of journalists and some you know some some real friendships have, have developed as a consequence of it um and within that unscripted format you could have some real fun and people would say stuff that was very amusing we used to be able to find a way of dealing with some very serious issues of the day but you find those little gaps where there's room for a bit of a bit of levity and heavens knows we need a bit of that because yeah. otherwise you know you switch the news on and it's it can be unrelentingly bleak if you're not careful and that we are acutely aware of that as well because some people are news avoidant they don't want to watch the news anymore because it's just too depressing well that's a very good point that you've raised i'm glad you have because particularly amongst the younger generation um there are individuals that that actually don't know about what's going on in the news because they they don't even want to watch tv they for them uh it's youtube and if you remember during the pandemic the government used influencers for the first time um because they needed to get people to wash their hands and young people weren't going to listen to the bbc or any other government message but all of a sudden if their favored youtuber or influencer was saying guys this is important you've got to wash your hands <laughs> suddenly it was it sort of grew very rapidly um so i think it's a really interesting point about um uh, and i remember again just going back to covid how the government briefings every single day about death and and it was it was it was quite overwhelming and i think some people have become um affected by constant bad news and have chosen to avoid it well, the, the, the statistics absolutely support that. Yeah. And some parts of the world, the news avoidance levels are even higher than in, in the UK. I, I oh, yeah. read the Reuters Institute journalism report last year, from last year, and Brazil had a particular problem with it. I mean, and their political landscape is, has been extremely turbulent. Mm. Um, I, I will just add that during COVID, we did very well, actually, uh, with TV viewing figures because everyone was at home. Of course, um, people would yeah. sit down to watch at five o'clock when those press conferences happened. And often people would sit as a family because everybody wanted to know what the next set of restrictions were, were going to be that were imposed or lifted. And it was, I was very heartened that several of my uh, children's friends who are in their teens um, said, I don't believe it if Martine hasn't told me about it on the BBC. <laughs> so I was really pleased that we were making some poss possibly temporary inroads um, with with teenagers. But it was nice that they recognised the 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 um, the trust they could have in us. Um, but yes, the BBC is very mindful of the fact that people are news avoidant. So there are several different things that people are that we're doing. So we're growing our social media presence. So um, you'll find. BBC News accounts on Instagram, on TikTok. Seen them, yeah. And yeah. They, they they do very well. And well, that's because that, they're, that's they're shorts, aren't they? They're shorts, they're little sound bites, which yeah. which are sometimes all you want that will drive you back into the to the main story. But very yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Some somebody in social media at the BBC said to me a few years ago, um, "We're a gateway." but yeah. we need destinations to send people to. So if we can pique somebody's interest on TikTok, for example, they might then switch Radio 1 on and listen to Newsbeat, mm. or they might go to um, an explainer page on the website. So we need to provide people with a, a, you know, a suite of options, but we need to invite them in in a way that is appealing to them in the first place. So that that is, is definitely a, a growth area as more and more of our content goes online.
Mm, great. Well, that's my space. Um, and um, I wanted to ask you to sort of finish uh, Twitter or threads. Well, at the moment, very much Twitter. That's where I have my following. And I it's the first place I go to in the morning, partly because there are tons of other journalists on there. Mm. And I will get a breakdown of different news stories, which then drive me towards the BBC News website or a newspaper's website. Or it might drive me to a long read on a website that I wouldn't ever have heard of before and I th the reason I like Twitter is that it does expose me to because I've followed such a wide range of people it exposes me to thoughts ideas writing that I wouldn't necessarily have, have come across but then I also have apps for several different newspapers on my phone obviously I have the BBC website app uh, BBC news app should I say and um, I have joined threads but I've also joined Mastodon I've also, when there was a bit of, you know, worry about what was happening with Twitter a few weeks ago, I have joined Instagram. I'm doing okay on that. And what else have I joined? Be Real? No, my kids use Be Real. Yes, they sort of mind. Yeah, they use that. I like that, though, because it's sort of an honest um, demonstration or sort of s snapshot into your life there and now. It's not sort of all dressed up and glossy and photoshopped. So yeah, obviously I use Facebook for that's for friends. Um, I do use Instagram. I'm getting better at. I am on Threads, but um, there's a, there's something very intuitive about Twitter, and it may be because I've been on it for years. But that's the place that I go to to share most of my my content. Yeah, no, it's my, my um, unopinionated content. <laughs> so, <laughs> any plans for the future? I mean, you and I were just talking, sort of off off air, about what what you might like to do, you know. Uh, and you were saying to me, um, "I can do anything," you know. I've now well, well, democratized society where we where we can if we want to. I just correct. You. I didn't say it quite like that. People think I'm terribly big headed. I think <laughs> I've got to that point in my life where my children are older and I've got a great job and a you know reliable income and I'm extremely uh grateful for that and I recognize that not everybody has that. But with it comes choice and freedom. And it occurred to me that you know I've got the time and the space and, and thankfully enough financial stability to, to pick and choose what I do and if I want to write a book I know I can write a book if I wanted to become you know a, you know championship tiddlywink player or something you know I've got the time and the space to go and, and do that so I'm not going to say too much here but a very old friend of mine who I've known since my local radio days who who is a local radio presenter um, he and I have, have come up with an idea for a, a podcast or a series of uh, little you know social media series of reels and things which draws upon a subject that whenever we come back to it on Twitter it always gets a lot of input and it's about celebrating differences across the UK mm. I'm not going to say any more than that because we actually got to get it off the ground yet but <laughs> we think we think we can do it and we think it would I, mean, I don't really care if we make any money out of it I just think it would be a fun thing to do and I think it would it would be quite fun and engaging and there's no real purpose to it other than to celebrate what a wonderfully varied country it is that we live in. Right. On that note, Martin Croxall, so thank you very much for joining us on the Influence Global podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you.